Good morning. Let's have everybody uh, here in the auditorium move to your seats so we can get rolling here. Uh, we're happy to welcome everybody who's online to our services this morning, as well as the people who are here for the in-person services. Uh, this is a wonderful spring day. Uh, we have seen the, or maybe we've just heard, <laughs> The, the power of God overnight and uh, his provision for his creation. Uh, and so I just want to start our service this morning with this verse out of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And we gather together online and in person to worship this creator God that we serve. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. We do have peace through our Jesus Christ, our Lord. If it is convenient, please stand as we sing. Oh, for a thousand times to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master, Assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the wonders of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, to his life and health. the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. Blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold our Savior come and leave ye lame for joy. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray as one. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for helping us, and thank you for saving us by sending your son. And thank you for all who are graduating from college and from high school. And please help Norman John's nephew with his cancer. And please help the McVales, and please help Latiwe. And thank you for sending your son to die for us on the cross. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin and not molest to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet. 
Hello. <laughs> Threw you off, didn't I? We always say good morning, so I, thought I'd, I just thought I'd be different. <laughs> but it is a glorious day. We had some wonderful rain and a little bit of thunder and lightning. As Dave said, we probably heard it more than saw it. But it's great to be together today. Uh, just a quick announcement before we begin. Our Sunday night life group uh, next week, we're going to be doing a series on how to be biblical citizens. And uh, obviously for all of life, our instruction manual is what? It's the Bible. It tells us how to have godly relationships with our spouses, our children, neighbors, one another as God's people. But it also tells us how do we live as, nation, uh, as citizens in our nation. And the focus will be on our responsibility to God, uh, what God expects of nations, what God expects from us, how to be biblical citizens. And that will start next week at 5 o'clock. All right. Well, I think what we're going to do here is we are just going to jump right in with a review. There's what we did last week. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. That was last week's lesson. We talked about this characteristic of God, this name of God. And that word Shalom, as we said, it means wholeness, but it's also translated peace. It means so much more than just you know, not having hostility and just a tranquil life. It's talking about being at peace with the Holy God. And that is glorious news. And as you see the context, what we did last week, we did Judges chapter 6, verse uh, 24 was our theme, but it came from the story of Gideon. And there was, if there was ever a man who didn't have peace and had doubts, it was Gideon. And he needed that peace and encouragement from God. So this idea of shalom, peace, wholeness, this is what God gives us. And I love this concept. We all do. We like this concept of, of, of being at peace with God, having this peace. But sometimes I think, do I really understand or really see, no way I can totally understand it, but do I, do I, do I begin to see what it costs God to bring this peace to us? This peace between me and you and God. Because ultimately it is a peace between a holy God and an unholy people. But here's the verses for us, just was in the title for the sermon, Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Christ gives us peace, and he does it through the blood of Jesus, through the cross. And that, that's the deepest peace we can know. Because through the cross, our lives are right with God. We are in Christ. We have an eternal hope. The world can't take it from us. Reconciliation with God by the blood of the cross, the blood of Jesus. But how often do we really think about the enormity of what God has done? There's no way I can fully grasp it. Do, but do we, do we think on the enormity of this? Again, do we see what it costs God to give us shalom? What it costs God to be Jehovah Shalom? Now, we are saved by the blood of Jesus. However, and this is going to be a lot of review and some, some ideas this morning. Hopefully we're all familiar with this, but it's good to go back through. And to remember that the concept of blood in the Bible doesn't begin with Jesus and the cross. You know, the blood, the blood is the thread that, that runs all through Scripture and ultimately it leads us to the cross. And I know that there is no way that I can do justice to this concept of blood. There's just so much, there's so much there. But it's my prayer that we can all grow in our understanding of what the blood of Jesus means. How the blood of Christ comes from the very heart of Jehovah Shalom. And I came across a story that I think illustrates how the, the concept of blood sits at, at, at the very center of, of Scripture. Here's what I came across. The writer says, Not long ago I heard a missionary talk about a boy who appeared and a friend with him at a mission hospital in Kenya with a gaping wound in his foot. He had accidentally been injured while cutting grass far out in the jungle. You know, part of his heel was cut off. 
Without waiting to inform anyone of the mishap, the two boys set out across country to find the mission statement where they had heard medical help was available. The journey was long and difficult, but at last they arrived. And after a time, the boy's mother appeared. And the doctors were surprised that she found the way. There were no well-defined trails, and she had never made the trip before. How did you do it, she was asked. The woman, overjoyed to be with her child, replied, Oh, it was easy. I just followed the blood. And starting with the Old Testament, we can follow the blood all the way to the cross. Because the concept of blood, it's found all through scriptures. There are over 400 specific references to blood in scripture. And there are many more references when we look at related concepts like the altar, sacrifices, offerings. But when we get to the New Testament, it's the blood of Christ that becomes the focus. And the New Testament teaches us that Christ's blood makes our relationship with God possible. Uh, first, uh, you know, we've talked about this verse before, but, but 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, that's where Peter talks about how we have been ransomed from sin and death, not with something physical like money, you know, gold and silver, but, the, but with the precious blood of Jesus. And he says, an unblemished lamb, the blood of an unblemished lamb, which we talked about in our class this morning. And Peter, if you notice that text, he says, we've been ransomed. That means bought back. A price has been paid. God paid the price for our sins with the blood of Jesus. And this word ransom tells us that our salvation didn't just simply happen. God didn't just up one day and say, okay, I think I'll save you now. It cost something to buy us back from sin and death. And God didn't buy us back with something worldly, something temporary, something corruptible. Peter said God has bought us back with something that's beyond anything we can even imagine on earth. Everything that we know in this world is perishable, but God bought us back with something that's imperishable. He bought us back with the blood of a precious lamb, an unblemished lamb, the blood of Jesus. And the idea behind that word precious, we know what it means. It means of ultimate value. There is nothing that can be greater and nothing ever will be than the blood of Jesus. Because there's life in the blood. And this concept really begins in the Old Testament where God began to lay out his requirements for, for the sacrifices for Israel. Basically, he was laying out, here's how you're going to live in my presence. Here is how a holy God brings you into his presence. And he began to lay it out in the law as Israel was in the wilderness. And here's what Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by my life. In the sacrifices Israel made, the blood was devoted to God, the blood belonged to God, God allowed it in an animal sacrifice, and it was done to atone uh, for the sin of the one who committed it. We see this concept in the sacrifice given by Israel's high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. There were several things went on, but one was the sacrifice for sin. And that sacrifice reminded the Israelites that they had sinned and that God had provided a way for them to approach Him. And they could approach only through the blood of a sacrifice. We see the same thing in the Passover. Now some people say it's a little bit different, but really it's not. When you think about what happened that night in Egypt at the Passover, the Israelites were spared by the blood of the Lamb the night God passed through Egypt. And in Egypt, all the firstborn died. But Israel was spared from God's wrath because of the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't because they were more holy or deserving. It was because God had chosen them and He provided the blood of the Lamb. And they were saved from the wrath of God that night. And ultimately, this brings us to Jesus and the cross, the true Lamb of God. We have peace from God through the blood of the cross. And I know I've talked about this before, but the cross was a terrible thing for people to even contemplate, to even, even imagine in the ancient world. It was a horrible method of execution. The cross was the ultimate symbol of scorn and shame. And, and, and the Messiah, even, if, well, we could put it this way, more accurately, God in the flesh dying on a Roman cross, that was a shocking concept. 
The Jews and the Romans had a hard time grasping that God, that Jesus, would do this. And the big question was, I think, why? Why would Jesus die on a cross? And I think a similar and perhaps even more pointed question would be, how could a Roman cross possibly serve God's purpose? How could a cross possibly have anything to do with God saving people? And you know what? A lot of people are asking that same question today. Do some reading. Do some listening. And here's the question. Why was the cross necessary for God to reconcile us, to bring peace to us? Why was the cross necessary? And people, and I read this statement, if God is all about forgiveness, why doesn't He just forgive us? God expects us to forgive one another, so why can't He just do the same? But you know, it's one thing for a human to forgive another human. Oh, it changes when it comes to God forgiving. And to answer the question, we have to look again at the holiness of God. Because the cross is all about a holy God forgiving unholy people. And the question is not, why why can't God just forgive us? The question is, how can a holy God possibly forgive us at all? John R. W. Stott, uh, he wrote a little book, or really not a little book, but it's a great book. You You should read it. We've got it in the church library. I keep pushing that every time I bring him up. I don't know if anybody's checked it out, but you should. John R. W. Stott, The Cross of Christ, on page 88. He says, Forgiveness is to man the plainest of duties. To God, it is the profoundest of problems. And it all begins in the beginning. In Genesis, with the fall. In the beginning, in Genesis, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God. They had a perfect relationship with one another. But then sinners, sin enters into the picture in Genesis chapter 3. And the sin of, and, uh, uh, of Adam and Eve, the sin, the sin they committed, their sin was that they desired to be God. To remove God from His rightful place over creation over them. See, they were already created in the image of God, but they wanted more. They wanted God's place. And this is, this is really the root of all of the sin in our world. People want to be God, to displace God. Of course, when you read Genesis, the result was Adam and Eve were separated from God because that's what sin does. It separates us from God. And God created the man and the woman, and He gave them everything. Everything that He did came from His goodness, His purity, His holiness. But what Adam and Eve did is they rejected the holiness of God. And for God to then associate with the man and the woman after their sin would mean that God would have to encounter something tainted, something unholy. How can perfection, absolute goodness, God's holiness be in relationship with sin? Our God is who He is. And He cannot stoop to where we are. He can't come to us on our terms a holy God, and unholy sinners. God can't just say, well, okay, I forgive you. He can't just say, well, it's no big deal. I'll overlook it this time. He can't. It's not possible. It's not possible for a holy God to tolerate sin. It is not possible. And here in one verse that I'm going to read, at least the first part of it, is what lies behind the idea of sacrifice in the Old Testament and carries over most powerfully into the New Testament. It is Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. God is holy and He cannot tolerate sin and sin separates us from Him. All sin deserves death. None are righteous. We all deserve the wrath of God. And this is such a serious concept And we need to ask ourselves if we're really aware of just how serious this concept of sin and deserving death really is. I came across what one person wrote, and I thought he really really put it into perspective. He said, imagine the power of God behind his wrath. When you look up into the sky on a clear night, you can see what is called the Milky Way, the name of our galaxy. It uh, It has about 200 billion stars in it. You can see maybe a 40 millionth of them on a good night. The disk of the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across, about 600,000 trillion miles. This gets beyond me. And 2,000 light years thick. 
our sun will take about 200,000 years to make a circuit. And besides our galaxy, there are some, uh, as some estimate, 50 million galaxies. Now God simply spoke and all the galaxies came into being. And he holds them in being by the word of his power. This God is so great that any attempt to portray his greatness falls infinitely, far short. But what we can see and feel is this, that if such a great God is angry at us and has such indescribable power to back up his anger, then we are in the worst possible condition. Nothing could be worse than to be opposed by the wrath of this infinite, powerful God. I think we should all desperately want to have peace with this God. But that's where the bad news comes in. There is absolutely nothing we can do to make ourselves holy in God's sight. There is nothing we can do to redeem ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right with God who is holy. It is God who must intervene. The initiative comes from God. Only God can cleanse us and make us whole again and bring us into that relationship with him. And in the Old Testament, as God began, he spanned this great distance between himself and his people through sacrifices. The sacrifices that God instituted in the Old Testament taught that restoring relationship with God is costly. We go back to Romans 6.23 I've, I've read. The wages of sin is death. That is the death that sin requires. Sin requires the death of the one who sinned. But because God loves us, He begins to prepare that way to restore relationship. The common thread that runs through the whole concept of blood and sacrifice in the Old Testament is this. Substitution. The animal took the place of the person making the sacrifice. The animal was made to stand for or to symbolize the person or persons who were making the sacrifice. The offering of the sacrifice to God was the substituting of another life for one's own. And when the blood was spilled, it symbolized that a death had actually taken place, although literally it had with the animal. But the blood being shed showed that a life had ended, a life had been given, atonement had taken place. And in the Old Testament, the blood is given back to God. But as we read on into the New Testament, we find there was one problem with animal sacrifices. Hebrews 10 uh, chapter, or Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The animal sacrifice was not enough. The law required the shedding of blood, a substitute for sin, but the life of an animal is not equal to that of a person. So the Old Testament sacrifices were not enough. But God accepted these sacrifices, and he did this because he was looking to the ultimate sacrifice that he would give. All these sacrifices were pointing to what he would do later. Because he was preparing for the one great sacrifice, the giving of the blood of Jesus. And when we get to the New Testament, everything comes into focus. God gives a new qualification by which people can stand before him. We can now have fellowship with a holy God through the blood of Jesus. And the giving of Jesus' blood was the only way to establish this relationship with God. And Christ's death has significance because he had already been teaching his people all those centuries about what sacrifice has been, what they were all about. And the law taught that sacrifice was absolutely necessary in order to have a relationship with God. But again, Hebrews says these sacrifices were inadequate. Because an animal does not equal a person. It's not equal. Person, animal, not equal. So what did God do? While an animal and a person are not equal, the life of Jesus is more than equal. Oh, what an understatement. What can I even say? Jesus in his perfection and holiness did not deserve to die. Therefore, his death could be the, the one time for all time 
sacrifice for sins. Jesus' total self-giving was what sacrifice required, and he alone was qualified to do it. We go on and read a little further in Hebrews 10, because Hebrews goes on to say, For by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And a verse that just goes right with it, 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, it says, for our sake he made him Jesus. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And these verses go to the very heart of the whole concept of the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. We are the ones guilty before God. The penalty is death, and a holy God cannot overlook sin. God cannot violate his, his character, his holiness. The debt must be paid. And it has been. A death did occur, just as God's holiness demands. And we are the ones who are guilty, but God substituted Jesus on our behalf. I know we've said this often, but we need to see the power behind this. Jesus took our place. He died so that we can live in relationship with God. And as a result of the cross, God is still holy. Sin has occurred, but the debt has been paid Paid by the precious blood of a lamb. And while we find the background in the Old Testament for Jesus' sacrifice, the New Testament shows us that there is one very dramatic difference. There's a difference between what happened at the cross and the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Because at the cross, God actively participated in what was happening. It was God who was bringing and making the sacrifice, not the sinner. It may have been the people in the Gospels who drove the nails into Jesus, but the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament tell us plainly that it was God who gave Jesus as a sacrifice. And we talked about this, I think, last week in our class. Even beyond that, John 10 tells us it wasn't just God who gave it. Jesus said, I give it. I lay my life down. I take it up again. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. It is God and it is Christ who are making the sacrifice for our sins. And I've been talking about Romans 6.23, but it's time to finish the verse, isn't it? You know the, you know the rest of it. Romans 6.23, where the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And at Jesus' death, when you read through the Gospels, you read Matthew's account, we find that the curtain in the temple, the, the curtain that separated the holy place from the, the most holy place, the holy of holies, there was that curtain that separated uh, the people, even the rest of the priests, only the high priest could go on there and make that sacrifice once a year. Only the high priest could do it. When you read the book of Matthew, when Jesus died on the cross, it says that that curtain was torn in two, ripped. Sin had been conquered, and now the way into the Holy of Holies is for all of us because Jesus is our high priest. This is how God made peace with us. This is how God is truly Jehovah Shalom. And I know in our modern world, the concept of blood sacrifice, it doesn't resonate with a lot of people. The image is too violent, too disturbing, I think sometimes for our modern sensibilities. But that's where the work of the cross really confronts us. The cross, the blood of Jesus, does reflect a violent, disturbing, almost unimaginable event. But that's our sin before God. Our sin is a violent ripping at God's holiness. And the reason that so many struggle with this concept is because we don't have a realistic picture of what it means to be fallen and what it means to have fallen from God's grace. The violent picture of the cross and blood of Jesus should cause us first and foremost to see ourselves the depth of our sin, all of us. Just like Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I probably could read the text this way. For all have sinned and fallen way, way, way short of the glory of God. And we could just keep going. But while the cross confronts the depth of our sin, it also shows the deep, deep love of God. Jesus went through that violent, horrible death to pay our debt. And we know it was paid because he rose from the dead and he conquered the sin and the death. And he did that to bring us home to God. 
And no matter how deep our sin at the cross, God's love goes deeper. And if we have some sin or sins in our lives that we feel are just too great for God to forgive, if we're constantly feeling guilty over wrongs we've done, we need to go to the cross and we need to see the true absolute power that God has to transform and forgive. We often say this, but do we see it in reality as we talked this morning? There's no sin God cannot forgive. And if we really understand what we're talking about this morning, we see just how true that is. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. The Lord makes us whole. And he does it through the cross of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus, the cross of Christ, sits at the center of who God is. It sits at the center of his love for us. And God does not want us to ever be very far from the cross and the idea and the understanding of the cross. You know, at the Last Supper, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, we know that he gave them the the ultimate, true meaning of what the Passover was really all about. And in Matthew 26, verse 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of my covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And we are going to be doing that in a little bit, taking the Lord's Supper. And when we take the Lord's Supper, communion each week, we're reminded, never take your eyes off the cross. Never take your eyes off what it costs God to save us. And ultimately, here is what the blood of Christ has done for us. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. We are whole. Our God truly is Jehovah Shalom. And that's something to rejoice in. And at this time, we're going to have the invitation It is yours, and if you need to respond for any reason, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing.
Amen. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to wish all the mothers Happy Mother's Day today. I, with all that my wife does for our family, I think every day should be Mother's Day, but for, especially today, we want to wish all the mothers Happy Mother's Day. So thank you for all that you do and continue to do for, for our families. So Chris and I did not get together this morning before we did the comments and sermon, but could pretty much just I could just say just see Chris's sermon and then we could just take the communion but it's always a good idea to review so we're gonna hit some of the same points that that he hit in the sermon it was an excellent sermon thank you Chris so um, in the high school and junior high class we started uh, the summer we're starting now but we're gonna go through the summer and we're gonna do a review of the Bible just a broad overview of the entire New T Old Testament starting out and so we'd look at each book just as a big a, a snapshot of each book and a few weeks ago of course we started at the beginning with Genesis and one of the things we talked about in Genesis was of course the the creation story in Adam and Eve and Chris alluded to this in his sermon and um, we had this idea of course Adam and Eve God had given them everything he'd given them the Garden of Eden and blessings beyond measure there and he said any of this is yours to take except he gave them one exception of course that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the interesting thing about that is is God could have prevented them from taking that fruit from that in any number of ways obviously he's God he could have stopped them from taking it just physically stopped them removed the tree from there put an angel with a sword in front of it whatever he could have stopped them but no he gave them a choice he said you can have anything here except of this he said do not take of this and he gave them that choice to choose him or to choose that and of course, we know the story, Satan, or the serpent, deceived Adam and Eve, and they took from that. Instead of choosing God, they chose themselves. And cho instead of choosing the blessings that God had given them, they chose autonomy, or basically becoming their own God. And, and what the verses there, in Genesis 3, verse 15, we have this verse where God addresses the serpent. And he says, I will make enemies of you and the woman, of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And we kind of gloss over this verse just thinking, well, God's just, you know, punishing the serpent here and saying that they're going to butt heads. But most biblical scholars believe this is a prophecy about Jesus. You will, he will bruise your head. He will destroy Satan and sin, but you shall bruise him on the heel. He shall, he, shall also be, he shall also be injured. And, of course, these two things happened simultaneously at the cross. Jesus was injured as he destroyed Satan and sin. And so we get more of this idea, more prophecy about this in Isaiah. Isaiah writes of this injured, this injury. So Isaiah 53, one of the most interesting chapters in the Bible, Isaiah 53, this prophecy about Jesus. So, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we, and all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid the iniquity of us, iniquity, I'm sorry, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then skipping down to verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By the knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You see, this gives the reasonings why Jesus had to, had to have that injury. He bore that because of our sin, as Chris talked about, because of what we have done, he bore that. And he shall bore their iniquities. But the good news is we have salvation because of that. Because he bore our iniquities, we are saved. You know, we have a choice today, too. It's a different choice than Adam and Eve had, but it's also the same choice. We can choose God. We can choose to put faith in his son. We can choose to be baptized and have our sins washed away. Or we can choose ourselves, and we can choose to be our own God, just as Adam and Eve did. That spiral began at the beginning, it continues to this day, and that's why we're in the mess we're in. But we can choose God. We can choose to be saved. If 
you've not made that choice, if you're in this room or if you're watching from home, we would love to talk with you more about that choice. But now we'll say a prayer and thank, be thankful for the choice that was the sacrifice that Jesus made that gives us the opportunity to have that choice. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, Almighty God, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord, and we thank you for your son who died on the cross. As we take this bread, which represents his body, help us to remember the sacrifice that he made. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray again. Dear Lord Almighty God, once again we come before you, thanking you for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed on the cross, Lord. And as we take this, help us to remember it. This is how we have forgiveness of sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. announcements here says happy mother's day and i'll say it again as we've heard uh, there will be an ltc leadership training for christ awards and presentations immediately after worship today as we close our worship uh, they're going to be setting up it'll take five or six minutes uh, if you need to go we understand if you're able to stay and see the presentations uh, and the, some of their awards please do it'll last about 30 minutes uh, still get you in time to uh, take your mother out for a br uh, brunch or a lunch before the Methodist and Baptist get out so we'll be we'll be good uh, we're honoring the college graduates today I think this coming week is finals week and we have five students that have worshiped with us uh, Ryan Mayberry, uh, batch, he's getting a Bachelor of Art, Fine Arts in Design with an emphasis in industrial design. Tyler Partridge will earn a Master of Music degree in trumpet performance. Megan Schwerman will graduate with a Master of Arts degree in Museum Studies. Ethan Shields will receive a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Voice from the School of Music. And Tiana Gilliam, Gilliam has completed her Master of Music Education degree. So we'd like to recognize those uh, college students today. We will be recognizing our high school students in two weeks on this May 23rd. Um, and that's it for announcements other than we do have a prayer request. Uh, please pray for Don and Joyce Grammer Don was diagnosed with lung cancer on Friday and needs all the prayers he can get. And this is from Helga. So we need to keep Don Grammer in our prayers. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You are the giver of life. You are a giver of peace. You are holy. You are divine. And there's no way for us to inhabit with you, except through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that brings us freedom and brings us peace. Father, we do pray for your kingdom. We pray that we may be ambassadors, that we will tell others of your wonderful love and your grace and your peace. We thank you for all of our blessings, Lord, for the food that we have, the clothes, the places to live, you've just given us bountifully. Father, we do for, ask for forgiveness of our sins when we fall short. We're thankful that the blood of Christ washes us with that blood to make us white as snow in your presence. We thank you for your love that you sent your son to suffer and die in our stead. 
Father, we do pray for Don Grammer, who's been diagnosed with lung cancer. We pray for good medical attention. We pray for your healing, Father. We pray that you be with <clears throat> Don as he goes through the procedures that are necessary. We pray that you be with his family. Father, we pray for the family of Susan as she lost her grandmother this week. We pray that you would give them strength and health and peace in her passing. You know, we know that she loved you. We also pray that you be with Sherry Adams as her brother Barry died this week from COVID. We pray that you would be with Sherry and her family, comfort for peace. Pray, Father, for your continued healing for Richard Grizzly from his stroke, also with Kevin Tesca and his heart conditions, cousin of David, with Joe Eagleman as he is treated for skin cancer. We pray that you be with Casey's mother as she goes through chemo and radiation for her cancer. Father, we pray for Latiwe in Africa, that you will heal her leg situation, that she be, be restored. Father, we thank you for our mothers. We thank you for the love that they always showed us, that we could do no wrong in their sight. We just thank you for the loving kindness that you put in to mothers to show her children. Father, we pray that you be with our graduates this week as they study and get tested in finals. We pray that you would help them to be successful and that you would go with them in their careers to follow. Father, we pray for the leaders of our country, the leaders of our state, leaders of our city. You have put these people in power, and we pray that you would put on their hearts to make good and just laws. We pray, Father, for your ending of the pandemic. We pray that you will help us to do all we can in the healing process that needs to go about. We just pray for an end to the suffering and the death that this has caused us. Father, and we thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of animals, bulls, calves, lambs, sheep was not enough. It took the man Jesus, God with us in human form, who lived a perfect life to shed his blood for us. We thank you and praise you. In his name we pray, amen. I would like you to leave you with these words today from Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face, face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Shalom, peace. Go in peace. We're dismissed.